Chapter 8, There's No Place Like Home. They are going to cut a hole in him, a hole to his heart, so we don't have to keep sticking you in the arm. Alex puts a hand to his wrist. There is plastic there, a tube in his arm, taped to him. The hole is for the poison, to kill the thing that's attacking him, to kill the thing that's killing him. The hole won't hurt, they tell him, but the poison will. The poison feels worse than the thing attacking him. Sometimes the only way to fight something ter terrible, they tell him, is with something even more terrible. Alex jerked awake. His stomach and arms burned. He was in the bus again, that bus, the one that the wolf had destroyed trying to get him. He was lying on one of the ripped out cushions. Beside him sat Mrs. P and Nanny May, who was reading a book. The bus was stopped and the sun was up, but he didn't know if they had driven anywhere or not. He felt like he'd been asleep for days. Alex sat up and his stomach and arms screamed in pain. The bandages on his stomach, he understood. That was where the wolf had clawed him. But what happened to his arms? Minor burns, the, nan the nanny told him. She checked a bag of clear fluid that ran down to his arm in a tube from the rocket launcher. I'm afraid you were caught in the crossfire. Had to be done, though. Sometimes the only way to fight something terrible is with something even more terrible. Where had Alex heard that before? He shook his head. He'd been dreaming something about tubes and poison. Hold still while I take, while I take this out, Nanny Mae told him. And she removed the needle from his arm and wrapped it with a bandage. Thanks for going for help, Alex said to Mrs. P. And he could swear the cat nodded. Dorothy joined them just as Nanny Mae was finishing up. How is he? We were right to bivy up here. An overnight rest is exactly what he needed, but no strenuous activity for at least 24 hours more, and that includes baseball. But we have a game today, Alex said. Calm down, calm down, Dorothy told him. The game's been moved to tomorrow. The stadium's not ready yet, Alex frowned. How can the stadium not be ready? Dorothy led Alex and Nanny Mae off the bus past the empty driver's seat. Poor Lester, Alex said. Does anyone know what happened to him? We're assuming the wolf ate him before taking his place, Nanny Mae told him. Outside the sidewalk was packed with men in top hats and women in bustles. Horse-drawn carriages passed by on the cobblestone streets. Victorian London, Dorothy explained. A lot of classics take place here. Is this where your book is set? Alex asked the nanny. No, dear. I'm a thoroughly modern 20th century nanny. She tapped her metal soldier helmet metal soldier's helmet as proof. Still, it's good to be back home, no matter when it is. Alex wished he could say the same thing. Dorothy led them across the street and into Hyde Park, a big green place with trees and gravel paths and a curving river. On the next rise, Alex could see what looked like a giant red Chinese pagoda with golden roofs that curled up at the corners and carvings of long snake-like dragons twisting around its pillars. The structure wasn't totally built, but it didn't have cranes and scaffold scaffolding and construction workers all over it. Instead, it was looking at an unfinished painting. When they got closer, Alex saw that's exactly what it was. Toad and Scraps were standing at the entrance of the elaborate stadium, staring up at a small Chinese boy wearing what looked like red silk trousers, a brimless red hat, and a red jacket with a yellow, short yellow collar. He had a paintbrush in his hand, but no palette or paint came or can, can to dip it in. Still, wherever he moved the brush, new parts of the stadium appeared. Ni hao, old boy, Toad called. That means hello in Chinese, he to told his friends. The boy in the silk outfit waved hello, then painted himself a winged dragon and hopped on its back to fly down and greet them. Alex stepped back as the dragon coiled and writhered. But the boy wiped it away with a damp rag as soon as his feet were on the ground. Ma Liang, good to see you, good to see you, Toad said, pumping the boy's hand. Ma Liang smiled. I know what you want, Mr. Toad. He moved his brush like he was painting on the air, and something shiny and metal began to appear. 